Let's say you want to track a car's motion to draw and predict its trajectory. You have above cameras that record the entire scene in which your car can move. But now that everything is set up, how can you get only from those images the position and direction of the car? Today we're going to see the intuition behind PCA and how this powerful statistical operator can be utilized in image processing for object tracking. How from this single image can we track our car position and direction? Well, first of all, what would be nice is if we could isolate the pixels that are useful to us, here the car's pixel. To do that, we're going to use a threshold method. The idea is simple. We convert our picture into a grayscale picture, where values range from 0 to 255. Then for each pixel, we see if its value is higher than the threshold we defined, and if so, we keep it. This method relatively works well here, but might not with other type of images. Other methods do exist to extract a specific part of an image, like OZU thresholding, case segmentation, blob detection, canny edge detector, and so on, but we will stick with this simple one. Now, before jumping into the core of the problem, we must introduce and understand some very useful statistical tools. Let's say you're looking at the grades students got at the last exam. You have an array of those grades that you decide to plot on a line like so. Now, in order to know how well the students performed, you compute the mean value of those grades. But here lies the issue. The mean itself doesn't tell you about the performance of the class, because the same average can be obtained by those two very different distributions. So, to really get a picture of the classroom performance, you also need to compute a value that gives you how grades distribute around their mean value. That's a variance. To construct variance, we first compute for each value its error relative to the mean value. Then, we sum all of those error terms together and divide the total by the number of values. But this only gives us the average error rate of our values. To get variance, we need to square each of those terms in the sum. Squaring those terms first assures that no error will cancel each other out, but most importantly, it will penalize the bigger error. And voila, you just constructed variance, a statistical value of your distribution telling you how values distribute around the mean. The second figure we got to introduce is covariance. Imagine now that you have two sets of data that are linked. For instance, the age of a person and the amount of money they spend on groceries. Well, you can plot your data on a 2D graph where the x-axis is the age of the person and the y-axis the grocery money. If variance tells you how values distribute around the mean value, then covariance of A and B tells you how the variation of the distribution A influences distribution B. Covariance formula doesn't really differ from the one of variance, only that instead of squaring each error term, for each point, we multiply the error term of A with the error term of B. And voila, you just constructed covariance, a statistical value telling you how two distributions affect one another. Now, let's go back to our picture. What we want to compute is the direction and position of this cloud of pixel. But now that we know about variance and covariance, we can look at that cloud of pixels as two joint distributions. So, computing their variance and covariance will tell us how a change in the x-axis pixel distributions affects the y-axis one and vice versa, which is another definition for direction. So, the problem now is how to compute the direction vectors of our pixel blob only from variance and covariance. The answer is to throw our variance and covariance into a matrix and compute its eigenvectors. For some of you, those words might be completely new and overwhelming. What's a matrix? What are eigenvectors? And how in the hell will this give us the direction? I'm going to explain this right now and give you the intuition to have behind this unintuitive process. A matrix can be written down as an array of values. Matrices can be of any shape, but the most common and useful ones are square matrices. Here, we will only look at 2x2 two two matrices. So, imagine a 2D plane where vectors can be drawn. 
these vectors can be represented as a 2x1 array containing their x and y coordinates. But most importantly, you can think of each point of the plane as being the vector going from 0, 0 to its coordinates. Now, if you want, you can create a function that takes as an input a vector and gives as an output another vector, like this function for instance. While this definition of the function works very well, another way to represent it is by building one of its representative matrices. So now, to compute the output of a vector through that function, you only have to multiply the vector by the function's representative matrix. Therefore, matrices can be thought as a transformation operator that can shift an object's shape and orientation, at least in two dimensions. But now, what are eigenvectors? Well, eigenvectors are defined by the following expression. Let V be a non-null eigenvector of the matrix A, and lambda a real or complex value, then A times V equals lambda times V, which means that passing V through A doesn't change V's direction, but only its magnitude by a factor of lambda, which we call an eigenvalue. So let's take back our example of a circle defined by multiple vectors. Then when passing all of those vectors through A, we can see that some of those vectors don't move but only extend or shrink, they are eigenvectors. Now, one last important fact about matrices is what we call the spectral theorem. This theorem tells us that every real symmetric matrix have eigenvectors, and especially that the matrix transforms our initial circle by stretching it along its eigenvectors. So now let's go back to our variance and covariance. As I said before, variance and covariance tells us how a cloud of point is shaped, thus the covariance matrix defined as followed can be thought as a transformation that will shape any circle distribution into the distribution that defined the covariance matrix. And thus the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix that exist because this matrix is symmetric really gives us the axis along which the transformation happens, also called direction. And so that's what PCA is, and that's how we can find our car's direction. In terms of programming, we first scan through all the pixels of our image. If we find the car pixel, we add its coordinates to an array. Then we compute the mean value of the x coordinates and the y coordinates, so that we can compute the variance and covariance according to their definitions. Then, by using a linear algebra library, you manually create the covariance matrix, then ask the library to compute the eigenvectors. Then, by keeping the one with the biggest eigenvalue, you get your object's direction. What we saw here is a specific case of use for PCA or prime component analysis, generalize other domain and other dimension. So I hope you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like if you liked it or a dislike if you didn't, and I will see you next time.